Tabernacle Baptist Church. Hello to the online friends and hello to everybody who is here in person. Love seeing all the chatter and the, the fellowshipping and all of that. We'll start out this evening with, are you washed in the blood, correct? Are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this time? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you walking daily by the Spirit's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And then going right into our second song of the evening. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing at all but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my part. I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus and the last this is all nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow But the blood of Jesus. And with that, Mr. Eric, I'll have you come up and I'll have you open tonight in prayer and uh, bless the series tonight. And while you're opening, I will run up there and I'll get ready to hit play on the DVD and we will be ready with session four this evening. All right. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we just say thank you again, Lord, uh, for tonight. Father, we just ask that you bless this time, Father, as couples, that we can learn about one another and we can learn more about growing closer to you, Father, that our relationship with one another grows strong as we grow closer to you. And Lord, just ask that you bless this time, Father, that you, we would just focus and pay attention, Lord. And we ask all these things in your precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. seeks to fix her problem. But Audrey is not happy about this. Jeff says to Audrey,
Recently, I was in a small group meeting at my publishers, and uh, we were talking about male and female dynamics. One person shared a scene from the uh, sitcom, Rules of Engagement, where Jeff and Audrey, a husband and wife, are having a discussion. Audrey had an emotional burden and uh, kind of a problem, and Jeff seeks to fix her problem. But Audrey is not happy about this. Jeff says to Audrey, I, I was just trying to fix the problem. Audrey says, I specifically asked you not to. Jeff then comments, when my wife is upset, I got to do something. You don't take your car to a mechanic, tell him what's wrong, and then say, but don't fix it. Just listen and hug me. <laughs> Husbands, do you sometimes feel like Jeff? Do you get confused by what your wife expects of you? Do you feel that she expects you to know things that sometimes make no sense to you? I want you to hang in there. Some of this will never be uh, natural to you, as I pointed out. This is why God commands the husband to do these things, because he doesn't do them on his own naturally. And that's okay. You're an honorable man. And God calls you to do the loving thing, even though it doesn't always make sense to you and is not always easy. But when you follow what God reveals to you to do toward your wife, it empowers you, motivates her, and pleases God. In this fourth session, we continue with the energizing cycle. His love motivates her respect, and her respect motivates his love. We are unpacking the phrase, his love motivates her her respect. We are showing that love to a wife is very powerful and we're spelling love C-O-U-P-L-E. We will finish the acronym in this session. Each letter represents a key biblical truth to the husband and for the husband. In the workbook I want you to look at some episodes with Missy and Stu. For instance, what should Stu do when Missy says again this week, can we talk? Why do some men feel uncomfortable with that question, and understandably so? Also, what should Stu do when Missy brings up stuff to talk about that happened several days back? Frankly, Stu has dropped the matter and moved on. Is it okay for Stu to feel that Missy ought to drop it too and move on? Is she bringing it up in order to pick a fight? And what is a husband to do when his wife tells him, one of her problems, and she gets upset when he tries to solve it like Jeff did. Oh, and do not forget the devotional on sex. Did I mention the devotional on sex? Okay, session four, finishing how you spell love to your wife, a love that motivates her to respect you. C is closeness, O is openness, openness. Not being secretly mad at her, not being secretly mad at her. And this was a mistake my dad made. And again, my dad came to Christ when I was a freshman at Wheaton. The Lord changed him, tenderly so. And I never resented my dad, even though he attempted to strangle my mother, committed adultery, and everything. But one thing is my daddy had rage issues. And it was no safety zone. You know, he'd be going along and then, boom, it just, there was no warning. And, and my mom shut down. They divorced when I was one. They remarried, for which I'm thankful. But then they separated for six years. But this was a mistake my dad made. And he didn't have a dad. My dad, my mom always said he didn't have a dad. His dad died when he was three months older in flu epidemic in 1918 that came across this country. Many, many people died. So he grew up without a dad. And so I empathize with my dad, even though there was pain. But I saw the way he did it with mom. And mom just withdrew. She just, he wounded her emotionally. She was a very dynamic woman, had three businesses, just a great personality, just a wonderful individual. But she just, you know, the dad's anger. And the reason dad got angry is to try to teach her, you know. He thought if he did that, she'd respect him. And in the process, she just felt unloved. You're not going to get her to think blue if you curse her in pink. It just doesn't work. And my mom just closed off. And, and this is overkill. This anger that we as men express, it's overkill. It's like you got a fly on the wall, so you stick some dynamite on the floor. <laughs> You got the fly. <laughs> that was how my dad's anger was. And that's where some of you men are. And I appeal to you. It's overkill. It's, 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 way, it's beyond you as a man of honor. 
But see, I understand because you're processing it from the standpoint that she's showing you disrespect and contempt and it's creating this fight in you. But you've, you've got to realize that's not her goal. It feels that way because no one talks to you that way. And so you're at a point of crisis on the marital bus ride. Which way are you going to go with this? Are you going to take up a fence and blow up the house to get her to stop? Dad got mom to stop. She just shut down and left. It's effective. It's like sitting in a house when the snow comes through. Michigan, half the house is gone, it gets cold. That's why Paul says in Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. That's all he said to the husbands in Colossians. Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And I was meditating on it. I said, well, Lord, why should a man love his wife who's making him mad? <laughs> love your wives and do not be embittered. And the Lord, the guy's embittered. He's secretly, it's not the outburst of anger. Oh, 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 oh. So, so, Lord, why would a guy love a woman who's making him mad? And then the Lord, bam! Whatever it is that he thinks she's doing to make him mad, she's not. She's doing what she's doing to be reassured that he loves her. And so Paul goes right to the heart. Just love her. That's the need. She's not trying to make you mad. If a man treated you that way, would he be trying to make you mad? Absolutely. Guys, we don't treat each other. We don't, we don't talk that way. But don't project onto her because you want to be in a position where you say to your son-in-law, knock it off. This is my precious little girl that when she was five, she was on my shoulders and we would dance around. And don't you take advantage of her and you follow my example. You must have that moral authority to protect your precious baby girl. And so you must show him how to do this. Otherwise, your little girl, who you know will be reacting probably to him like she did to you during her teenage years, <laughs> and he's going to take up a fence. And I will tell you that here's another thing. You can be mad but not mad at her, and she'll still think you're mad at her. It's called the personalization. Women personalize. So you're mad. You're not mad at her. You don't want to worry her about what's upsetting you. So you come home, but she can tell. So then she begins to think, I wonder if I said or did something earlier that made him mad. She begins to personalize. And, and this has been researched. In fact, I read about this, and so I tried it out. And, and I asked one of my good friends, Ray Blackwell. We were together. He's a man's man. He was head, third in, in the highway patrol. He was a chief, and he's just a warrior, a photographic memory, just a personality, funny. But Ray and I were together one night, and he made some hamburgers. And I said, hey, Ray, where'd you get these hamburgers? He said, I got them down at the market. End of conversation. Next night, Sarah's making hamburgers. I said, Sarah, where'd you get these hamburgers? Why? What's wrong with them? <laughs> See the personalization? Why? Because she's insecure? No, she cares and she wants to please. Ray, he could care less whether I like the hamburgers. <laughs> I don't care. Give me yours. <laughs> Get away or I'll kill you. It's just... Uh... And, and here's something you add to that. We talk about men being compartmentalized, whereas women are integrated personalities. Integrated personalities. Her mind, body, soul, and spirit are connected. So when her spirit's wounded, she's not going to be sexual. She, she can go through the motions, but her mind's a million miles away. She's just not, She can't. It's all connected. Integrated. Social research points that out. Men are compartmentalized. compartmentalized. We can put our emotions in, in compartments and lock it. I was in Manhattan on 9-11. And the first responders, most of them were men, we put our fears in our compartments and we marched to our death. I've had women who are captains and colonels in the Marines. I had one woman who was a national black belt artist. And I asked them about their emotions. And she said, unequivocally, we women have to deal with our fears and emotions in a way that men don't have to. And so you have this compartmentalization, which allows us to literally die. 
But when you apply that in the area of intimacy, it can be a killer <laughs> to your wife. And so then she, and so this was, so you put, I don't want to worry her. I just, I just want, and, and furthermore, if you had a bad day, you don't want to talk about it because it just reminds you how bad it was. And so what men want to do is disengage, put those emotions in a compartment, bring it up tomorrow, but right now move into what they call frivolity. They want to disengage and do something that's just silly fun. That's why men love to play with kids. They love to play. Men bring play. Men want to disengage and play. It's a huge role that we fulfill in the child's life. And it's partly rooted in our desire to move into frivolity. Okay, so here you have, though, this man who wants to disengage. And she's wondering, well, how was your day? How did it go? And she's pulling you out. And some women say, my husband's a mysterious island. I'm forever paddling around him. <laughs> but he doesn't permit me to land. <laughs> but she's taking her canoe, gentlemen, and she's going up your shoreline. <laughs> And when she stops, you have a problem. Women are very aggressive, but when that aggression stops, that's why when a man gets divorce papers, you'll hear some of them say, I had no idea. And you think, oh, come on. No, because the last year she stopped irritating him. She stopped moving toward him to complain, to criticize. And he thought things were wonderful. <laughs> it's true. These guys are not oblivious. It really was a friendship he thought was... Because we don't enjoy this. And so he was actually kind of happy about things. That's why it's like, where were you at? So gentlemen, some of you think, well, I, I'm so irritated by this woman. You need to see that as a compliment. <laughs> see, and one of the things I make is that women want to talk about marital problems on a daily basis to keep the relationship up to date in order to prevent you from having major marital problems. Generally speaking. And if you're a woman who doesn't want to do that, there's a fear that usually drives that. You're fearful of what he's going to do with your emotions. It's not because you don't want to do that. Don't say you're an exception. There's a woundedness there. You're the exception. And you know it. Don't twist this. You're in pain for some reason. And don't you twist it if you say, well, she didn't want to talk to me. What did you do to her? So one of the things we have to do is go back and revisit this because it's an explanation. But here's the deal. She wants to talk about marital problems on a daily basis, keep the relationship up to date in order to prevent you from having major, major marital problems. <laughs> I'm thinking, if you're talking about marital problems on a daily basis, you have a major marital problem. <laughs> and I said, Lord, who's right in that inaudible voice? Yes. <laughs> See, we're both right, folks. It just depends on whether you're going to videotape it through male or videotape it through female. And see, the problem today is that because I'm a woman, as a woman, I know I'm right, then he's got to be wrong. That's an erroneous conclusion. And the man says, because I know I'm right, then she's got to be wrong. And we pass judgment on the other as though somehow they're bad. Why are we killing each other? We've got to do this dance. It's not comfortable it's just that he made us male and female. So here's the deal. Gentlemen, God is calling to be more, more open with her than you have been. Don't be closed off in that anger. But relax and open up a little bit more. Now, you're not going to be as open as she is. Women will get to go, oh, do I have a story for you? I mean, women just, you know, they give the report, they'll report. Oh, did you, I mean, this, they're on it right now. And with, you see when women get together, it's just, boom. This is right out there. Okay? <laughs> Most women. But, you know, so, so you're going to be less open than she is, but you can be more open than you have been. And you can tell her more of your day, even though you don't want to rehash it. I get that. And you can reassure her that if you're mad, you're not mad at her. You can do that. You're a man of honor. It's not about me. I'm mad. I want to go run for a couple miles, and then I'll talk about it. I'm just so upset. She'll have your favorite dessert ready. She, will, she can handle that. Women feel very comfortable what we call the ocean of emotion. University of Washington call it that way. They, they, when you give her the hint of what it is, she will be right there. She's very responsive. That's why when you went through depression, it's probably the best the, your relationship's ever been. She's, she's fixated on being able to nurture. When you tell her you're hurting over something that's unrelated to her, she's there. Unless you're just pouting, you know, over something you always pout about. I mean, I'm, again, you work with me on the frame of reference here. And then don't close off to teach her how to respect you. <laughs> so 
And here's something that I made a mistake. Sarah will ask me questions and I feel she's calling me into question. Years ago, uh, she sent my mom and me on these errands. We're to go to A, B, C, and D. My mother's a widow at the time in her 80s. We're to go to A, B, C, D, and be home for dinner. And so we're not home for dinner when we're supposed to be. And so Sarah calls and we're still back at B. And so Sarah says, where are you? Why aren't you home? And I'm beginning to feel interrogated, even though she's making honest inquiries. She's asking questions, and I feel she's calling me in a question, and I said, okay, all right, I'll be honest with you. Mom and I stopped at a bar, and she had one too many to drink, okay? <laughs> and she's in the back seat right now, slumped over. Mom, sit up, get up, get up. I got sarcastic with Sarah and pushed back. Then one day I thought, what if Sarah sent my mother and her best girlfriend on these errands. They go to A, B, C, D and be home for dinner and they're not home for dinner. What's Sarah going to do? She's going to call her girlfriend and say, where are you? What's going on? And what's her girlfriend going to do? <gasps> oh, the time has gotten by so I feel horrible. I'm so sorry. Is dinner burned? What's... No, dinner's fine. Are you okay? Oh, yes, we're okay. But you know what happened? We're going through that counter line and that, that clerk there, Mary, she's going through a divorce. She started to open up to us and my heart really feels badly for her. We got to put her on the prayer list and your mother and I were really listening and we really, you know, took more time we should have. And then your mother, remember, we didn't get ketchup so we had to go back around and got the ketchup. And then she borrowed that plate from you. You remember that plate she borrowed and she washed it and she forgot to bring it over the other day and she wants to bring it back tonight. So we're en route to get it and I feel horrible. Are we really, what's going on? No, are you okay? No, I'm okay. Well, no, everything's okay. Then I'll see you in about 20. Yeah, in about 20. Okay. Love you. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Once I realized Sarah was just talking to me the way she talked to her best girlfriend because she cares. It's worded in that nurture. She's burdened. She cares. I began to process her and interpret her differently. She wasn't treating me any differently than she did her best girlfriend. And some of us men take up offense when if you step back and look, she's doing toward you what she did toward her best girlfriend. And that can change the nature of things. So decode, why is she reacting in ways that feel disrespectful to you on the marital bus ride? Is she feeling unloved? Did you close her out? Did you close her out in anger? Are you not open with her? Is she wondering what's going on inside of you? And I'll tell you this, when you are open with her emotionally, she opens with you sexually. <laughs> About eight men just awakened in this assembly. <laughs> <laughs> Sex! How long has he been talking about that? Give me your notes. That's why I paid this money and I missed it. What did he say? C is closeness, O is openness, U is understanding. When Sarah and I were first married, Sarah would come to me with a problem, and then I would try to solve the problem, and now I had two problems. <laughs> and I needed to learn to ask this question, honey, do you need a listening ear, or do you need a solution to the problem? And then she was gracious to me. She said, I just need a listening ear. See, that really was the solution to the problem. She really knew how to solve the problem, but she's wired differently. And this is why 1 Peter 3, 7 says, you husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way. An understanding way. As with a weaker vessel, since she's a woman, so that your prayers may not be hindered. General, if you say, no one can understand that woman, the Lord is not going to listen to you. Why? Because he's the Christ and you're the church figure. In relationship to your wife, you're the Christ figure, she's the church figure. So she comes to you with her burdens and you are to understand her, try to empathize with her. In the same way as you bring your burdens to the true Christ and he empathizes with you. And the Lord is saying, fair is fair. If you're not going to be the Christ figure toward you, her, I'm not going to be the Christ toward you. I'm not going to listen to you. I believe Peter experienced that with the resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ. He prayed one day and the Lord said, I'm going to listen to you. We know he was married because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. And so I think that Peter is basically saying, look, I learned that if I don't live with my wife in an understanding way, the Lord is not hearing my prayers. And the reason I need to live with her in an understanding way is that she's a woman. But then there's this phrase here that the feminist movement uses as reasons for them rejecting Orthodox Christianity because it says weaker vessel, which then suggests that men are the stronger vessel. But let me share with you what that verse means. First of all, it's what we call a comparative statement, not a qualitative statement. It says she's weaker, not weak. Secondly, it says she's weaker in relationship to one man, not in relationship to humanity or to masculinity. That one person is her husband. So she's weaker in relationship to her husband. Thirdly, she's weaker in two areas. When he does not understand her as a woman, and when he does not honor her as an equal, which is also in that verse. 
honor her as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Because I was trained in academia in some ways, I know what the feminist movement has been espousing. And two major tenets are these. You will understand us as women, and you will honor us as equals. Because otherwise you victimize us. And we will bring consequence to you who do that. Now, in this culture, don't, don't do that. Peter's saying the same thing. And some of you women have rejected the apostles. You love Jesus, but you can't stand the apostles in their sexist comments. This is not a sexist comment. This reflects the heart of the feminist doctrine. But you need to repent that you have listened to women who are good-willed intellectuals, but who do not love Christ. They may even hate Christ, but they are good-willed women. They are smart women, but they don't know how to interpret the scripture. I just did. And you have stiff-armed the scripture. And Peter ends his epistle in the second one, our beloved brother Paul, who says some things in his epistle, things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. Peter is already referring to Paul's writings as scripture. But he's also saying, don't mess with it. Trust Abba. Paul said in Ephesians 3, that which has been hidden in ages past has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. We must trust this. And I just said something to you that's precious. But let's get back to you men then. You are called to be understanding because your prayers are going to be hindered, but you're to understand her because she's vulnerable when you say to her, nobody can understand you. Your prayers are not going to be heard. And he's also appealing to you understand she's a woman. Have you not read? You made them from the beginning, made them male and female. Well, and let let me illustrate this. Just how these dynamics work out. Suppose you're in a group of 100 people and you're standing talking to your best buddy about this new Christian camp that just opened and you're saying that camp director's name is and you can't remember it and 15 feet away in this busy group, your wife says, Bob Smith. And she goes back talking with her girlfriend. (laughs) He says, she snoops. That's why she's always snooping. No. Did you know that women can hear two conversations at once? Watch when the two children come, seven and five-year-old, and they're tattling to her. She leans over, and both are talking at the same time. And then they spew it all out, and then she responds to one, and then watch her. Her eyes kind of glaze as she's replaying what this one said. It's an amazing thing. Watch when he's home and the five-year-old and seven-year-old come to him. One at a time. (laughs) One. Stop. Go ahead. I said, stop. Sit up there. Stop. No. No. I'm a good dad. <laughs> or on the phone, phone in the morning, she said, no, 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 you can't wear that, that pink outfit. It's not clean. Joe said that to you? When? Last night he was, I can't believe that. Harry's also said that to me. No, turn that down to 360 and just wait. She, she, it's amazing, multitasking. I've watched women, how do you do this? You know, watch when he's on the phone in the morning. Quiet! <laughs> what were you saying, Harry? No. (laughs) But what happens is as a female, because she's involved in so many things she cares about, it starts building up, building up, building up. It's like a steam, a a tea kettle, as I say. At a certain point, and you're the Christ figure. You're the burden bearer. And she comes to you to ventilate. She comes to you to release that emotion. Women will start talking to realize their emotions. They'll talk to release their emotions. They'll talk to build a rapport, giving a report. There are a number of levels. It's very sophisticated. The nuances here have depth. But you are the strength. And so she feels better as she dumps on you, so to speak, as she shares this with you. She's not looking for a solution. She's just getting this onto your shoulders. And she feels wonderful. He said, but Emerson, it's the same thing over and over again. You're saying she needs this emotion release? Yeah, but it's the same thing over again. I mean, the topics vary a little bit. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years. The kids are grown now, but I mean, it was, the topic was Joey when he was five and then when he was six. And then, I mean, it's the same thing over and over again. This emotion release, it's the same thing over and over again. Really? Yeah. Well, tomorrow I'm going to talk to her about your need for sexual release, and it's the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Not wrong, just... 
And God has given us holy analogies so that we would stop passing judgment on our spouses. Because once you realize, yeah, maybe she has a need to release emotionally the same thing going over again, but what right do you have to judge when I just gave you an analogy that's not too dissimilar and there's a moral equivalency? And we stop throwing stones at each other when we realize we both have needs and she meets your need, which is the same thing over and over again. And you meet her need, which is the same thing over and over again. But now suddenly the dance is kind of okay. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. It's what we call reciprocity. You're not keeping score. It's that you do unto others what they do unto you and vice versa. And it works. It just works. Now, ladies, this doesn't mean that you can just kind of dump everything on him. So you've got to select the topic and try to stay on topic because what happens, I've studied this, women will start with this point. You see them in a group of other women. Start with this point, but this point reminds them of this point and they don't finish this point. So now they come down here. So that's unresolved. Now they're on this and this reminds them of this thing. In the meantime, three kids come in and interrupt them and now they're over here on this. And then when you look at it, it looks like a spider web. <laughs> when you give them enough time, they'll go back and they'll close all of these. And... and <laughs> Within about an hour and a half. Some, some of these conversations have been going on for 30 years. It's true. They're all, and, but they, they track it all. It's just, it's just, you can't not do that. Why, I just, because I care. I, I feel, it's just, the, it's just the way God has wired you, okay? Sometimes we men just put our arms right down through the, the, the spider web. You can't do that. So you have to realize, okay, but here's the deal. You, you come home, do you know what happened today at school? They had a fire alarm. The kids were out. There was, actually it was cold up in the mountains area where there's all this sleet and Johnny got sick. He's really sick. I had to take him to the, the doctor. Well, what's, is, what, what happened? Well, that's, no, that's not my point. You know that nurse, <laughs> Sally? Sally is nurse. I saw her at the clinic. In fact, she's the sister of the guy that took me to the prom back in 1974. And he had that 57 Chevy. It was, oh, it was unbelievable. And it was a convertible and we went there. And, and in fact, I remember that dress I had. It was so beautiful. It was, in fact, that reminds me, did you pick up the clothes at the cleaners? Because our babysitter's coming at 7.30 and I want to make sure that, and in fact, they moved here from Phoenix. I mean, they are the sweetest family. This 14-year-old girl, there was just nobody like, but they're going to be here. And I, I, but at a certain point, he just goes, <laughs> Please, what's the point? <laughs> See, because he lost you back in the doctor's office. And you're saying he's not listening. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so ladies, what I want you to do is stay on point to be understood. And gentlemen, you stay in place to be understanding. C-O-U-P, peacemaking. 1 Corinthians 7, 28, if you marry, you have not sinned, but you will have trouble. There's going to be conflict. There are going to be moments, and this is important because this next one is P for peacemaking, learning how to resolve and reconcile. And listen to Jesus, Matthew 19, 5 and 6, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave his wife. We quoted that. He's quoting that. And the two shall become one flesh, one flesh. Consequently, they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And I used to think that last statement, let no man separate, was some third party. But he begins the text with saying, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother. Who is that man? The husband. On your watch, don't be the cause of the relationship to go under. That's why Paul says, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. As, as far as you can tell, and I think you're in the driver's seat on this one because women want to reconcile. There's something within them that wants to say, I'm sorry. And, and, and the problem is that they have conflict almost every day. And so it's kind of this dance that we kind of get tired of. But you have the power to bring about oneness and prevent this two-ness, so to speak. You can achieve unity. You have the power to do this. And both of you want peace. Nobody wants lack of peace. No one likes this conflict and tension. We don't like it. It's not energizing. But the way in which she resolves the conflict and the way you resolve the conflict are different. For instance, they've done research on two little girls playing hopscotch and then Sally and Mary get into a fight. Something happens and they start ventilating and Mary says to Sally, I don't like you. You're not my friend. I'm never going to talk to you again. Sally says, well, I don't like you either. And they separate. But then they'll come back together in a half hour or the next day and both of them are ventilating. 
ventilating and they can hear as they talk. It's amazing. Women can talk and hear at the same time as I pointed out. And then one will say, well, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that to you. Well, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I was really bad for what I said. No, will you forgive me? I was really horrible. And they both forgive and then they hug and then they, they wipe away their tears. And then one tends to be witty and she says something funny and the other throws her head back with laughter. And then they resume the hopscotch again. It's what I call bringing things full circle. They're doing an activity. They have a conflict. They separate temporarily. They come back together. They ventilate. Then one says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Will you forgive me? Yes. Will you forgive me? Hug, wipe away tears, wit, and resume activity. Women feel very comfortable. It's what I then refer to that as the ocean of motion. And they, they know how to do that dance, and it's very easy for them. But halfway through, he says, drop it, forget it. I don't want to deal with it. And so now you have this male and female difference. Now, why would he do that? Because in our world, we've been best of buddies since first grade, and now we're in our 30s. I borrow my buddy's baseball glove, and my dog eats it. Choose this expensive baseball glove and I come to Bob and I said Bob I can't believe it. my dog ate your glove last night he what Emerson ever since first grade every time I give you something to use it gets ruined you, uh, this has been the uh, you make oh man I, uh, and he goes into the kitchen now what do I do I instinctively know his heartbeats are 99 beats per minute. We've fought before. You let him calm down. I don't go, Bob, you come back and talk to me. <laughs> don't respond like a woman there. I let him calm down. Then I go to the door and says, I, I, I can't believe it. I bought this new glove for you. Won't replace that. It's got to be broken in. I, I feel horrible. And I'm telling you this. My dog's not seen the sun. I'm killing him tonight. <laughs> this is about 10, 15 minutes later. What's, you know, I, when I say that to him, Bob says, oh, drop it. Forget it. Hey, here's the Pepsi. Let's go watch the World Series. And when my best buddy says that, it's over with. And don't bring it up because you'll just remind me how stupid you are. <laughs> okay, so now who's right? Yes. But gentlemen, you're the honorable man called upon to do the loving thing, and there are times when you've got to bring it full circle with her. It's honorable to say, drop it, forget it. That is an honorable thing, and it is a wise thing, and I'm going to tell her tomorrow that she needs to do that at times. But right now, you need to see who's the mature one and who has the greater vulnerability, and if this is an issue that she just can't drop. And ladies, some things you've got to learn to drop. If you don't drop anything ever, this is your insecurities. This is not his failure to love you. But there are moments when this is not her insecurity. She needs reassurance that you love her and she needs to talk it through and release it. And peace will come. And when you say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? She says, well, I'm sorry too. I shouldn't have. And it's just a beautiful thing. Some of you men have lived so long with the thought that if I make any statement about being sorry that she's going to pounce on me. That's not her goal. That's not her desire. She will, if you do this, what I just said, say, you're just doing that because Emerson told you to. She will push back. She'll get, but don't let that defeat you. She's seeking, is this genuine or are you just trying to score points here? So, decode. Has she been reacting in ways that feel disrespectful to you? Have you said or done something earlier that felt unloving? Did you say, just drop it, forget it. I'm not going to talk to you about it. I don't need to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not never talking about it. That's a killer. You're putting a knife in her. Knife, knife, knife. She's not a man. She's a weaker vessel when you communicate. No one can understand you. I'm not going to try to understand you. I'm not going to be at peace with you. I'm not going to try to be one with you. I'm not going to try to resolve this with you. It's it just, it's just, you, you don't understand that this rate's pretty high on her radar screen. It's kind of like she's just, just, you know, I mean, it just doesn't, I mean, she's so com confused. And you see it, but you can't think, well, why would she even feel like this? this is no big deal. We could move on. No, 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 no. Not for her. So just say, I'm sorry. And I will tell you again, this is a sexual turn on to a woman. When you are genuinely saying, I'm sorry, it touches her spirit. See, some guys are working out all this workout years, hours on end. 
get this body, thinking that the women are going to get turned on to them like they get turned on to a woman in a bikini. And women like, they don't like, you know, big, fat, slob type thing. They, they, they are visually oriented. But overall, it's personality. It's the heart. I know guys that got pop bellies, sucking straw, haven't worked out for years, but are saying, I'm sorry. And she grabs her hand and goes to the bedroom with him. You need to understand here what touches the heart of the woman. Some of these guys got it figured out and they're not breaking a sweat. C is closeness, O is openness, U is understanding, P is peacemaking. Loyalty as the L, being completely committed to her. This one, one more, and then we'll be heading out here. Malachi 2.14, the wife of your youth, she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And most of us here stood on an altar and made a vow to God. And it's not one-sided. It's not just us making a promise and God's cosmic killjoy. No, when we make a covenant, we make a covenant with him, and he will help us. But he, he expects us to be true to the commitment we made to him and to our spouse. And ultimately, our loyalty is a reflection of our loyalty to Christ. This isn't really about your wife as much as this is about Christ. But then in Malachi 2.16, it goes on to say, For I hate divorce, says the Lord. He hates divorce. He hates it. Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. And so here you have our Lord saying, look, I want you to honor your marriage commitment, this covenant. I, I hate divorce. And, and your wife usually is a one-man woman, though the epidemic of the women walking away is a new thing. Women are walking away two to three times more than men. By and large, most women are a one-man woman. And she wants to know, are you a, a one-woman man? And she, are you committed to me? That's why when she says, do you love me? And you say, yeah, I told you that 17 years ago. If anything changes, I'll let you know, okay? <laughs> but she's not asking for information. She's asking for reassurance. And, and that's why, though, some of you men don't understand. You are not the enemy here. You're the victim of the enemy. But the pornography industry is going after you as a male because we're visually oriented. And some of you have gotten involved in this. And then you've gotten to a point where you just dismiss the, the, the fear that comes over her and the, and the insecurity. And then she, 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 you know, shames you. But then she moves into self-deprecation. What's wrong with me? Am I not good enough? And you, you've been doing this dance. But you need to understand what pornography viewing is doing to your marriage and to your family. And some of you don't get it. You're, you're, you come to such a point where you just dismiss it. Hey, I'm not doing the thing. I'm just looking at it. You, that's like her saying, hey, Joe down the street just got his fifth pr promotion. He looks like Atlas. Look at all those Mercedes in front of his house. These are CEOs in the community who are meeting with him on Saturday morning to get his wisdom. He makes 10 times what you make. He's been coaching his kids' soccer teams. They were the national champions last year. The guy's incredible gentleman. Why don't you be more like him? What if she said that to you? Be a knife in your heart. That's what she feels when she sees you looking at pornography. You are not the enemy. You're the victim of the enemy of an industry that's making money off of an appetite in our carnal nature. And you're going to, what, what's going to happen is they're going to be rich and you're going to end up destroying your marriage. You're going to desecrate your daughters. You've got to come to a point, and I will tell you, if you're addicted, you'll never cease being addicted. Now you have to do whatever it takes, like an alcoholic, to stop drinking. Once it gets into that system, you're just going to have to say, you know what? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. That's why an Alcoholics Anonymous would always say, you know, hi, I'm Dan. I'm an alcoholic. Haven't drunk for 22 years. Hi, Dan. That's the way all the meetings start. You are a drunk. You're an alcoholic. It's just that you haven't drunk in 22 years. Thumbs up, but you're a drunk. You're an alcoholic. Don't ever lie to yourself. You have been victimized by this industry. It has corrupted your spirit, but you can come out of it. But I will tell you, you have to also decide, do I want to destroy this woman? It's a choice you're going to have to make. That's just one point. And the deeper point, though, is just letting her know and not using the D word as a club. You know what? If this isn't going, don't let the... Then you have the script in your mind at your dad. Don't let the door, back door swing and hit you in the rear end of the way out. You have these messages from the family of origin that are contrary to the heart of Christ. You use the D word as a way to try to motivate her to be committed. So one of the things we got to back up and say, Lord, I've made this covenant to you. I, this is about my relationship with you. And has, has your wife been reacting in ways that, that are disrespectful? Have you somehow sent her the message that you're going to leave her? 
<laughs> to motivate her to show you more respect. She isn't trying to be disrespectful. She's insecure in her deepest heart. Do you love me for me? That's all she's saying. You know, Dr. Dobson says, my friends Keith and Mary have been married for more than 40 years. Shortly after their honeymoon, Mary was stricken with polio and became a quadriplegic. The doctors informed her that she would be confined to a wheelchair the rest of her life. It was a devastating development. But Keith never wavered in his commitment to Mary. For all these years, he has bathed and dressed her, carried her to and from her bed, taken her to the bathroom, brushed her teeth, and combed her hair. Obviously, Keith could have divorced Mary and looked for a new, healthier wife, but he never even considered it. He said, I admire this man not only for doing the right thing, but for continuing to love and cherish his wife. And then Jim says this, though the problems you and I face may be less challenging, all of us will have our own difficulties. How will we respond? Some will give up on marriage for some pretty flimsy reasons. And let me insert, it's really a flimsy reason when your wife is crying out for your love, she reacts in a way that you think is disrespectful, you take up offense and you divorce her. Or your husband is feeling disrespected and unfortunately reacts in a way that feels unloving to you and you take up offense and divorce him. I don't think there's any more flimsy reason for ending a relationship than what I just said there. And then lastly, esteem. Esteem, treasuring her above all others. Back to that 1 Peter 3, 7 passage, grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Women need R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Esteem is part and parcel of love, just as we're going to see that in this respect that he needs, love is a huge component. But how do you honor a woman? How do you esteem them? Gentlemen, she has a different point system. I know of four men that bought their wives Mercedes because they were in fights with their wives and they thought, you know, I'm 50000 in the in the red here. If I buy her a $100,000 Mercedes, maybe that'll put me 500000 in the black. It put him 500000 in the red. Women don't want to be bought off. Boy, that just, they go through the roof on that. So gentlemen, if you listen to me, I'm going to save you a lot of money. Tomorrow after the conference, go walk in a park and maybe there's a flat rock there. Take that later that night in, in pink, you know, whatever. I will always love you, lover boy, and then put the date. Emerson was awesome, you know, something like that. <laughs> now project ahead 15 years. You've died. She's in retirement center. The adult grandchildren are coming over. Come on in, kids. What? That rock? You never saw that rock? Oh, your grandfather, after love and respect, he wrote this. And I, oh, there's no picture of Mercedes anywhere. The rock. See, women have a different point system. What we think, you know, we could, is huge to them is really small to them. And what's small to us is huge to them. You know, you buy her a Mercedes at 80,000 bucks, you think that's big, but she's livid. You write a little poem on a rock and she's through the roof with excitement. You buy her a diet book that's no big deal to you and she wants to kill you. You read the third marriage book and she's bragging about you to anybody that moves. <laughs> See, little things are colossal. Like one, one woman got off the phone having talked with her girlfriend, not her girlfriend, her sister, I mean, and she was talking to her, her sister and, and her sister was just this incredibly gifted person and she hangs up and she's like, I can't believe it. You know what she's doing now? She's making gourmet cakes. Last month she made rocking chairs. She took this carpentry class. She makes everything. All through the years she's made everything. What do I make? Your husband says, you make me happy. Oh, see? There it is. You see? It's called the sentimentality of the female. You just heard it. See, it's, it's, oh, oh. See, it's huge to her. And gentlemen, you need to understand, God has given us so obvious visual aids. Do we not pay attention to it? They don't just do that because that's what they're supposed to. It's the cue. Give me the, oh. No, it just, she just feels that. So here's the deal. Respect her worth to God. Respect her goodwill. Respect her in front of the kids. I used to say to the kids when they were smarting off to her, I'd say, hey, stop it. This is my girlfriend. And when you are older, you're going to leave the home. And when you leave the home, she and I are going to party. <laughs> so decode, gentlemen, has she been reacting in ways that feel disrespectful to you? Is she feeling unloved? 
Is she feeling you don't want to steam her? In fact, I had a guy in my office, I went through C-O-U-P-L-E, that your wife wants to be close with you, open with you, understood by you. She wants you to be at peace with her, to be loyal to her, to esteem her. And when you do this, she's going to soften and she's going to want to respect you. And he starts to weep. He says, she's filing for divorce because I deprived her of every one of those things. He was weeping in order to motivate her to show me more respect. I will just say it very simply. You cannot deprive your wife of her deepest needs based on these scriptures that God has given to you as a husband. You cannot deprive her of her need to motivate her to meet your own. But now, in conclusion, ladies, I want you to be patient because C-O-U-P-L-E is such a simple thing for you. And it's kind of like, come on, C-O-U-P-L-E, couple, 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 you can do it, you can do it, now, 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 right? <laughs> but he's, he's like the turtle, and you're the hare. Get away from me. <laughs> I'm not coming out. You're not going to be doing that cheer around me. Get away from me. I'll do it when I want to do it. Get back. All right, see, get back. <laughs> see, oh. See, and here's the deal he's going to be slow. And you're going to want him to bring flowers, he's going to fix the faucet. But there will be a gesture. Because he's a man of honor who's heard me tonight, and he's also been free to realize it'll never be natural. But he's a man of honor who does the loving thing because Christ calls him to do that, and he's going to get it. But he's going to be slower than you want him to be. So be patient. Be patient. It's not natural. Just as I'm going to tell him tomorrow when I coach you on how to meet his need for respect, for him to be patient with you because it is not natural. And you have no idea, even. You're, you're completely clueless, some of you, on respect. He's not been clueless on the love thing. So let's give each other grace. He's going to try to apply what he learned. It's not necessarily going to be done well. In fact, there was this couple. They've been married for like 17 years. And um, she had a career. Uh, they had a cat. They didn't have kids. Just cat. She had a 14-year-old cat. And uh, she was on the road quite a bit. Her mother, who was a widow, had recently moved in with him. And so she'd been on the road, this career woman, 10 days. She calls home to see how things are going. And her husband answers. And she said, well, how are things going? He said, your cat's dead. My cat's dead. That was my baby. You know, I can't believe my cat's dead. You know, I can't believe you said that that way. You know, you, you could have softened that a little bit by saying the cat's on the roof. <laughs> Call me back in five. I'm trying to get it down. And then I could have called back in five. You said the cat has fallen to the ground, but the fire company's coming to the station and they're trying to resuscitate the cat. Call me back in five. And then I could have called back in five and you could have said the cat's in cat heaven. But instead, you just said, the cat's on the roof. You know, all you men are insensitive. I just can't believe it. Oh, forget it. How's mother? She's on the roof. <laughs> now, the reason I like that illustration is he tried to apply what he just learned. Your husband has heard C-O-U-P-L-E. He will try to apply what he just learned. He won't do the best job of it because it's within your nature to do these things and you can whip it off real quick. You do that naturally. We don't. Give us some grace. He will try to apply it. It just may not be to your liking, but there will be a gesture. Respond to the gesture. Don't put him down for the gesture. Don't belittle him. Receive it. Soften your heart. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the simple truth of Ephesians 5.33. Husbands, love your wives. We're to cleave to her. We're not to be embittered against her, closing off our spirit. We're to live with her in an understanding way. We're to be covenanted with her, loyal. We're to be one with her during times of trouble, learning how to resolve these tensions. 
and we're to honor her as a fellow heir of the grace of life. We will do this as men of honor, though during conflict, it'll never be natural, and that's okay. And we will never blame her for being unloving because she appears disrespectful. Honorable men never do that. Through Christ we pray. Amen. See you in the morning. Okay. So, if, let's see, you want to do the lights, Mr. Troy? Or Sterling, or one of you two? Thank you so very much. Let's do like we usually do and briefly run over the uh, blanks. What is number one? I gave away, gave away all the books. Well, I actually don't have a book myself. What is blank number one in lesson four? Sure. You got, you got, you got them all? I don't want to, I don't want to steal yours. Okay. Amazing. So page 45. O is, what is it? O open and, open and, Open when you aren't secretly mad. Is that what it is? Okay. Open when you aren't secretly mad. Open when you aren't secretly mad. Open this. Open this when you aren't secretly mad at her. Okay. And then the you. What are the blanks on you? Understanding and... So understanding and empathize. So understanding and empathize. Understanding and empathize. Thank you, Clea. <laughs> nice to have one. You actually see what the blanks are you're looking at here. Excellent. Page 46. Did I get everything? Did I, am I going too fast? All right, 46, top of the page. P is? Peacemaking when you resolve. So peacemaking, resolve, and what's the other one? Reconcile. Peacemaking, resolve, reconcile. Peacemaking, resolve, reconcile. Peacemaking, resolve, reconcile. Okay, and then that gets us to the L. L is loyalty when you are completely committed. So loyalty when you're commi completely committed to her. So loyalty and committed. Loyalty and committed. And then 47, E is esteem when you treasure. So esteem and treasure, esteem and treasure. Okay, excellent, and that is everything, correct? Because now we're on to the, the discussion points throughout the week. Okay, excellent. I know some of the friends have joined from, uh, joined from home. Um, hello to those who have, who have joined from, the, from your homes. Uh, some comments and some laughs were made texting back and forth. When she drives you crazy, that's a compliment. That was an awesome line. I loved that line so very much. Very much looking forward to seeing next week and listening to that. So with that, I will, as we often do, I will close off the live stream and let you guys, uh, let you guys have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Hope you're enjoying it immensely. And again, text this, send this on to other folks if you would like. Uh, Brother Jerry, I actually already sent you the link, so you got... I didn't. I must have your number wrong then because I did send it. I must have your number wrong. Okay. But anyway, these are on Facebook, YouTube, so you can look at them later and get caught up or send them to somebody as you would like. So God bless you. Good night. And we will see you on Wednesday if you're able at 7.